Hi everyone, welcome to this week's class notes. Uh, this week we're reading The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And just as last week I used the fact that we were reading some works of poetry as an opportunity to talk in more detail about uh, how to analyze poetry, this week I want to talk some more about how, how to analyze works of fiction. Um, next week we're also reading a work of fiction. And so um, there are unique qualities to fiction, whether it's a short story, a novella, or a novel. And so that's what we'll really um, talk about this week in the class notes. And I'll use The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as our primary, primary example to illustrate some of the points I'm going to make. Uh, so first I want to talk about what are the unique challenges of fiction. So the challenges of analyzing fiction are quite different for us as 21st century readers than the challenges of analyzing poetry. With poetry, many of us just don't read poetry or read very little of it. And so poetry often feels intimidating or alien in ways that make it unapproachable. Fiction, on the other hand, seems very familiar to us, even if we are not avid readers. We are much more comfortable with fiction, especially with the novel as a literary form. And that's just because of what's happened with the popularity of poetry, which has gone way down, and the popularity of fiction, which has gone up. Thus, the challenge for us as critical readers of fiction, like this week's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, um, and which I abbreviate from here on out as Dr. J and Mr. H, which sounds sort of like a cheesy 80s sitcom, um, is to push beyond our familiarity with the form so that we can probe what makes each work of fiction compelling, what makes it an artifice. In other words, what makes it um, a, a, a constructed thing, you know, and, and how it's put together, and how the many features of each narrative shape our experience of that fictional text. Another way to think of this is that we want to defamiliarize each work of fiction so that we can better understand how the author builds the world within it using nothing but words. So in this week's class notes, I focus on four elements of fiction, plot, narration and point of view, character, and setting. There are many other elements that make up a work of fiction, including the use of words and figurative language and the exploration of subject matter and theme. Since I covered these two terms during last week's notes, about reading poetry, I'd like to really focus our attention this week on some of the more distinctive elements of fiction. Though, of course, one can find all of these elements of fiction described here in certain poems, especially the long narratives and dramatic monologues of many Victorian poets. So the first thing I want to talk about is plot. A great place to begin any analysis of a work of fiction is with the plot, the sequence of events that make up the narration. When analyzing plot, an important distinction to make is between the events of the plot as they would have occurred in chronological order and the events of the plot as they are represented to us, the reader. So, for instance, the story told in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is not told in perfect chronology. The best example of this is the final chapter, which contains Dr. Jekyll's letter, and that re-narrates events we have already witnessed. In essence, we sort of go back in time to, to review or re-experience certain events but from his perspective. Anytime we learn about events from the past or future out of chronological sequence, flash forward, flash forwards, flashbacks, things told out of order, we must ask what effect this has on our reading of the plot. If you want to see a wonderful contemporary example of the difference I describe here, see this chart that lays out in chronological order the events of the 1994 film Pulp Fiction. And if you follow that link, there's a great chart there that shows all the events from that movie um, laid out in, in sequence, so in the order that they would have happened in, in quote-unquote real time. So this film is famously told completely out of chronological order to amazing effect. So now you go ahead and pause what I'm saying right here, go watch the movie, I think it's like two and a half hours, and then come back. I'll, I'll pause for a second here so you guys can, can watch the film. Okay, and we'll move forward. Uh, you know, obviously you don't have to watch it, but it is a great movie that really beautifully demonstrates what we're talking about here with plot. Um, I recommend the, men the movie regardless of anything else. Um, it's a great film. So in addition to understanding the temporal sequence of events within a plot, we should also ask why the plot features the specific events and actions that it does. So whenever a writer sits down to write, he or she still is making choices about what to include in the, in the plot what to leave out. Why do these events happen? What does it mean that certain events are narrated the way that they are? So, you know, an author is making choices about what to include and, and how they depict the events that, that they choose to include. 
And why are certain events not narrated at all within the plot, as if they happened off stage? How do all of these elements of the plot shape our reading? In Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, consider why the story begins with Mr. Utterson walking the streets of London with Mr. Enfield. Why start that way? Why is that the beginning? And why do we then move to Mr. Enfield's story of his encounter with Mr. Hyde, an encounter that had already happened in the past? Again, why? And how does this affect us, us as readers? You could go through the entire plot this way, asking, well, why is this, why is this happening here? Um, and why do we not see these other things? Why is it told in this order? Why do we spend this amount of time on this scene and this much time on this one and this much on this one and so on and so forth? So one special feature of plotting is the climax of a narrative. Longer works of fiction, such as novels or even novellas, which, which are shorter than typical novels, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is an example of the latter, can have multiple climactic moments in the plot. And often a climax might be a subtle moment and not just the moment of the most intense action or obvious resolution of a major conflict. Traditionally, a story's climax is defined as the moment when the story's plot has come to some sort of head or turning point. Though how each work of fiction handles this can vary widely. What do you think is the climax of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Another special feature of plotting is, as already mentioned, the representation of conflicts. Indeed, the, the plot itself can be understood as the playing out through story and character some conflict or conflicts that unfold and evolve throughout the narrative. Again, the longer the work of fiction, the more likely it is that multiple conflicts are represented. What are the conflicts in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Which conflicts are internal, that is, situated within one character's internal psychology, and which are external, between characters, forces, ideas, etc.? One last major consideration when analyzing a plot is asking yourself what kind of plot you're reading. In other words, does the plot conform to any kind of tr traditional genre of storytelling? Romance, adventure, fantasy, hero's journey, horror, etc. And the, the little cartoon there on the right, which is, I think, quite funny, um, gives some other examples of different kinds of genres. Or an archetypal story, a traveler's tale, a tale of revenge, a tale of a fallen woman, uh, a slave narrative, a conversion narrative, etc. How does the plot conform to your expectations based on the kind of story you think it is? And how does it depart from or even challenge those conventions? So what kind of story, we should ask, is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Narration and point of view. Another key element in analyzing fiction is understanding who is telling the story, the narrator, and what that teller's relationship is to the story told, the point of view. Is a character within the fictional world of the story narrating it, that's first person point of view? Is an unnamed narrator from outside the fictional world narrating it? That's third person point of view. Does this unnamed narrator, narrator, if it is third person, have access to any of the character's thoughts and feelings? Does she only have access to what one character experiences, or can she move around from character to character? Does she com comment at all on what is happening in the story, or does she remain purely neutral throughout? And your answer to all these questions um, leads to different, different conclusions about the kind of narrator that we have. There are different kinds of third-person um, points of view, and we'll see that on the next slide. Does the point of view shift? Um, in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, we do have a changing point of view. How does it change and why? How does the point of view influence how the story is narrated to us, the readers? Uh, often, the point of view is easy to underestimate in terms of how its employment within a work of fiction shapes how we read the story. This is one of those things that really has a profound influence on how the story comes across to us and how we experience it. So what do you notice about how Robert Louis Stevenson uses point of view in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and how that point of view influences your interpretation of the story and the characters in it? You know, this is a great place to play a little thought experiment. How would this story be different if the entire thing was narrated from perhaps the point of view of the butler, Mr. Poole, or from the point of view of Mr. Hyde? Or Dr. Jekyll, right? How, how would that shape or influence the telling of the tale? So here's a chart to help you sort out point of view with additional terms to label different kinds of perspective. I'm, I'm less interested in you knowing sort of all this terminology than your ability to just be aware of and thinking about who is telling the story and um, what's the relationship to the story, you know, and kind of sorting out how that's then shaping your experience of it. Character. 
So characters are obviously essential elements in fiction. You need someone to do the some things, the plot that happened. Characters are also often the first element of a work of fiction that we really respond to on an emotional level. And so they take an, on an extra resonance for readers. With this in mind, it's important to remember that all characters are necessarily fictional constructs. And so in the same way that we could look at the different techniques and materials used to compose a painting of a person, when it comes to analyzing characters, we should look at the details about that character that create our sense of that person's wholeness as a character. So we all, I'm sure, have favorite characters from film, from television, from novels that, we, that really resonate with us, that stick with us for various reasons. And we ha it's important to remember that these are works of fiction. And so they have been created very carefully and skillfully by, if it's, if it's a novel, by the author, if it's a, uh, a film or a television show, by the actors, the directors, the writers. So the process by which a writer builds up our sense of each character is called characterization. Analyzing characters involves paying attention to what we learn about each character, how we learn it, and how these pieces form some sort of a cohesive whole that we call a character. When looking at characters, determine what role each character plays within the plot. Ask yourself, why is this character in here? How would the plot be different without his presence? When it comes to thinking about the roles characters play, we should distinguish between various types of characters. There's lots of categories for doing this, and so I'll just provide a couple of them right here, um, ones that I think are especially important. The most important difference to note is that between round characters, so psychologically rich, fully rounded out with complex inner lives, and flat characters, characters that come across as having very little depth beyond their role in the, in the narrative. Both kinds of characters serve their purpose in a story, and it is helpful to see the difference between the two in any work of fiction. Are there any round characters in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? What makes you think so? One more useful question to ask when considering character is who seems to be the story's protagonist? Is there a single character who the plot is most about or who draws the majority of our sympathies and interests? Identifying the protagonist isn't always as simple as it might seem. And sometimes you might determine that more than one character fits this role. In Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, who is the protagonist? When we talk about this novella, should we consider Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as two totally distinct characters, or are they one person? This is one of the main questions that that whole story is asking us, right? Are these two different people, or is it the same person? And if it's the same person, what does that mean? What are the implications of that? What about Mr. Utterson? Can a case be made that he is actually the story's protagonist? Um, right here, I actually have a, a word cloud from the novella. So this um, the larger the word, the more it shows up in the, um, in the narrative. And you can see here that utter sin is our biggest word. Um, and it's sort of interesting to look at some of the other words that, that, are, that are most strongly represented. What is that implying about who our main characters are, who our protagonist might be? Um, I don't think that this word cloud gives us a definitive answer, but it raises some really interesting questions. Uh, and finally, setting. So settings typically defined as the time and place that a story takes place, but it is much more than that. I prefer to think of setting as the entire rich medium of historical, cultural, geographic, and spatial realities that are inseparable from our understanding of plot and character. Setting then is the context that gives rise to character and plot, and that is in turn acted on by the characters through the machinations of the plot. So characters don't simply move through or within a setting, they interact with it. It is as alive as they are, and it informs who they are, and they in turn shape that setting. In Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the setting is London in the late 19th century, but the setting is also composed of all of the particular locations the characters move through, and the unique confluence of ideas about urban life, crime, science, and morality and friendship that intersect in this time and place. Even Scotland is, in a sense, part of the landscape of this novella. As the editors of our course textbooks relate, another writer, uh, G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton, argued that even though Stevenson, himself a Scotsman, set the story in London, that the city he depicts actually seems more like the Edinburgh of the time and that his characters seem more Scottish than English. This is what Chesterton argues. So if nothing else, it suggests that the depiction of London here is not, we're not getting access to, quote unquote, the real London of the time. This is Stevenson's depiction of London, and it's influenced by his ideas about London, about where he's from, about his agenda in writing this, um, and about 
some of the influences that he's not aware of in depicting it. So just as we must understand characters as works of imagination, we must always understand the settings of stories, as real as they might seem, also as fictional constructs. Thus, as we'll see, the London of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is not of the same London that we'll encounter next week with Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. And that's not just because Mrs. Dalloway is set several decades later, but it's because Stevenson and Woolf are, are different people. And so the, the way that they represent the city will be, will be influenced by um, how they view it and their own idiosyncrasies and what they're trying to achieve with their novels. Um, so that's the end of this week's class notes. As you saw here at the end, I've got a little um, preview or, or um, little tease about what we're going to be doing in the next couple of weeks with Mrs. Dalloway. Uh, and I'll see you all on discussion board this week.